course were to unlock your heart Will you play a game? I promise not to cheat Nintendo or Atari Boy, I think you're really sweet I'm a super scoring girl with glitches, graphics on my mind I'm like a contra good, I'm full of life but never out of time We can play together, you be playing one I don't play two as long as it's a good controller And I get to sit with you Entex. Not heard of them, right? Well, they are mostly forgotten these days. While Entex can lay claim to having released one of the first ever interchangeable cartridge consoles and one of the first ever interchangeable cartridge tabletop consoles. Exciting, right? Come on, be excited. Entex was founded in 1970 and was based in California, USA, specialising in making toys. They are most known for their electronic toys and for their scale model sets. They made these rip-off of Legos before they moved into the growing electronic games market. Now this wasn't a company that just chucked out a couple of products and bailed like Pantex or Supermicro did. Entex would create a whole load of electronic games. LED games, some with an LCD screen, and others with a vacuum fluorescent display. FYI, a vacuum fluorescent display is like on this Supercopter game, which incidentally is a direct ripoff of Entex's Super Cobra. Spoiler, this ripoff is way cooler than the original, and I will fight anyone who says otherwise. Directly competing against Mattel and Coleco, Entex's handhelds made the company some serious bank. They were innovative and nice looking, and there was a range of different playstyles. Look at how nice these pinball games look. In the late 70s and early 80s, these games were all the rage, and Entex seemed to have had a good portion of the market. You could shell out bags of quarters to play turtles at an arcade. Be bothered by less intelligent beings while playing Space Invader. But why should you when you could play Entex Turtles, Spiders and Space Invader in the comfort of home? In 1979, the Microvision was released by Milton Bradley. This was the first ever handheld console with interchangeable cartridges. This is what the cartridges look like, by the way, and they clip onto the unit like... Like... Ugh like this. This presented somewhat of a threat to the contemporary electronic game industry. Why would you waste money buying loads of different electronic games for different games when you could just buy one console and play loads of games on it? And with the success of the 1977 released Atari 2600, it was pretty clear that multi-cart consoles were the next big thing. Entex released this cheeky little thing in 1970, and from what I can find, it was their first attempt at an electronic device capable of playing multiple games. Now, it's presented as a mini computer, and I don't know if it could pass as a console, because I think these cards here are just overlays, and the game logic is pre-programmed. But still, the concept of one machine with multiple games was still comparatively new and exciting. Enter the Entex Selector game in 1981, a vacuum fluorescent display console with the pretty damn sweet option of using batteries or using an AC power supply, the latter of which the Microvision never had. Now obviously this isn't really the kind of thing that you'd shove in your pocket, but it is pretty portable. The first thing you'll notice is this thing has two sets of buttons. That's because, as you've probably gathered, it's made with two players in mind. Although all the games have a one-player function also, I expect this was meant to give it the edge over the Microvision, because let's face it, that thing feels pretty lonely. Yeah, imagine having your mate over. They wanna go and play outside. Stuff that noise. It's time for some sexy bleeps and bloops. Incidentally, this was not an unusual thing for Entex's previous electronic games. Lots of them have the two-player option, with these two sets of buttons on either side of the screen. This would set these handhelds aside from the Mattel offerings. The selector game having two sets of buttons does make this thing seem pretty hench. It would already be large enough with just the one set, but the whole thing? The damn thing is huge. This beast takes four C batteries. When you put batteries in, it makes it feel super solid, which I actually quite like. But for the sake of convenience, I am using this power cable. Sidebar, the power supply didn't come with the main unit and was only available by mail order, so it's very rare to find an official Entex one. It's cool to know that kids could have taken this thing on the bus to school to play with their mates though, providing they had enough room in their backpacks. You know what, this thing has so many pointy edges, I bet it'd make a really good murder weapon. Let's take a look at the box. 
Now, I am unsure whether this thing ever came packaged with anything other than the game Space Invader 2, as they are incredibly rare and I've only ever seen two listed on eBay in my life, and both of them came with Space Invader 2. The box gives the console a kind of toy feel, if you get what I mean. I can't put my finger on exactly why, but I think it might be because of this cardboard flap on the box. This was the box design that Entex used for their electronic toys too. There's nothing about it that jumps out at me though. I mean, for example, the palm text has a bunch of people on the box having a right time. But this, this is just a bit plain. It's not really kicking off, is it? The instruction book shows us that it was indeed possible to buy the unit just by itself, but apparently only via mail order. It says units will be repaired or replaced for this service charge. Now, I'm going to assume the $50 here is talking about replacing it, because $50 adjusted for inflation is $137, which is 105 quid in today's money. The Microvision, with its just one player option, cost one cent less at the time of release two years earlier, so comparatively, the selector game might have seemed like the obvious alternative, especially for young families with two kids. If you're gonna pay the equivalent of £105 and one of these two, surely you're gonna go for the one that you can play with your little brother or sister. Now let's get on to playing games. I have access to both Space Invader 2 and Basketball 3. The console itself has no built-in processor, the real magic happens in the cartridge. There were six games in total released, with an additional few ready for production, but that were never released. The reason for the low number of games is likely due to Entex dropping development on it just one year after its release in favour of their follow-up console, which I'll get to in a moment. Anyway, let's play us some Basketball 3. Ooh, a musical! This isn't basketball. All right, no, I'm not being daft. The games actually come with an overlay, which you will need to play the game at all. For the Space Invader game, this isn't really that essential because it's just a nice border, but putting on the basketball overlay makes things a lot clearer. Oh, I get it now. No, I don't. Now take a look at what's going on here. These red dudes are my opponents. This green dot is me. Now I know very little about basketball, but I'm pretty sure there's supposed to be a ball in here somewhere. So where the hell is it? Well, you're playing with an invisible ball. The steadily lit dot shows the person who is holding the ball. The team that doesn't have the ball flickers. Wait, no, hang on. All right, I tried very hard to work out how to play this game with the instruction book. I even actually looked up the rules of basketball just to see if it would help, but I have no idea what is happening here. And I mean, the instruction book shows that this game is complex as hell for a game that looks like this. There's inbounding, there's passes and offense ball control, shooting, foul play, just look at all these diagrams. I don't expect to need an A level in sports just to play a damn game. All right, let's play another game before my brain melts. How about Space Invader 2? This one is much more obvious to play. Your beam force cannon is in blue, your ground defenders are in blue, and you shoot blue missiles. The attack fleet is in red. So, simple. And despite the age of this one and the limitations of the platform, this one actually plays all right. However, if you switch the difficulty up, it gets pretty intense. In two player mode, one of you is defending the earth and the other is the alien attack fleet. Entex were being pretty ahead of their time to have a two player version here. You can see how many ships you have left here. Although the plastic buttons are a little bit stiff and angular, this is quite a good handheld version, especially for the time. And yes, by the way, that's Space Invader, not Space Invaders. The dropping of that one letter was avoiding a lawsuit. Also in the released game list for the Entex Selector game is Pinball and Baseball 4. I know what you're thinking. Why did all these games have numbers? There were only six games released for the console, so they can't have been sequels. See, I can read your mind. Ew, don't look at porn while I'm reading your mind. Well, quite simply, the numbered games are follow-ons from the individual electronic games released by Entex. I doubt that the pinball game will have gameplay hugely similar to the previously released LED pinball games released by Entex, simply as their design is very unique. However, Baseball 4 is likely to be an exact VFD version of the LED game Baseball 3. 
and by extension, its predecessors Baseball 2 and 1. Basketball looks to be another LED version of the VFD game that we got on the Selector game, and the same goes for Football 4 and Space Invader 2. So basically, the Selector game was the successor of the Entex Electronic game line. It was a console that had all of the sequels, if you like. Now, you might have noticed that on the box there are these big black stickers covering something. Now, because this isn't mine, I've borrowed it from console collector Asobi Tech, I'm not about to pull them off and see what they're hiding. But because this thing is so rare, I wasn't able to find any photos of the packaging without these stickers. And I want to see what's under them. Detective Octavius on the case! I am here to solve the mystery of the black stickers. There is also a black sticker on the actual instruction book itself. It's on the back and from the pages having been turned in the past, the edge of the sticker is just peeling off. And under that corner, I can just see the letters P and A. Now, I am absolutely certain that underneath those black stickers is the word Pac-Man. And in the case of the big black sticker on the back of the instruction book and the big square one on the box, it will say Pac-Man and a description of the game. Specifically though, it was Pac-Man 2 on the box, not Pac-Man 1 or Pac-Man. Entex's Pac-Man game was named Pac-Man 2, not because it was a sequel, but because it allowed two players. There was never an original Pac-Man game by Entex, although they did have a standalone vacuum fluorescent display version of Pac-Man 2. After Pac-Man 2 was made and released for the Entex Selector game, there was trouble. Coleco, who held the licensing rights for any handheld version of Pac-Man, decided now would be a good time to sue Entex. Which is fair enough. There was a settlement and Entex Pac-Man 2 was pulled from the shelves, which means it's the absolute rarest game for the system. But also, it means these black stickers were chucked onto the box and instruction book to negate the need of republishing. Once again, Detective Octavius has cracked the case. Can I have a job yet? Right, get out of here before I arrest you. Again. The game's Battleship and Turtles were also planned for the Selector game. The latter already existed as a standalone electronic game for Entex. However, despite it being advertised here in the 1982 Entex distributor catalogue, Entex dropped this console to work on their next one. By the way, in 1981 Coleco had this thing released, the Coleco Total Control. I wasn't able to find a precise release date, so I can't tell you if this is actually a response to the Entex Selector game, but it was released in the same year, and at first glance this might look like another console that works in the same way that the Microvision does, by having a cartridge that also acts as a sort of overlay. Well, even though this thing had cartridges, they weren't actually cartridges at all. They were just overlays that would make a connection to a certain chip on the console or something, which would then start up the pre-programmed corresponding game. So, Entex was still ahead technically of Coleco here. Entex did actually plan a Hensham or Bad Lad version of the Selector game, but it was never released. It was shown at a few toy fairs and it did have some promo material, so there must be one floating around in the world somewhere. This was going to be the Entex tabletop game machine. It was pretty damn big, with a 7x11 inch LED display. It was also going to be able to take the cartridges the Selector game had. In fact, that was all it was able to take. It didn't seem to have any bespoke ones planned. I mean, what you have here is essentially a massive version of this, which was already pretty big to start with. I suppose the larger one would make an even better murder weapon. Wow, what a fascinating handheld. The second handheld console with interchangeable cartridges ever released. Well, that console that Entex started working on after they'd finished with the Selector game? I've managed to borrow that too, and I didn't even need to break into the guy's house at 3am and demand it while he was still too sleepy to say no. But I did that anyway. Tune into my next video to find out about the super rare, super hench bad lad that is the Entex Adventure Vision. Less intelligent beings.